okay. All right. Hold on. Let me let me take a glance. Um, how are is everyone in the room yet? More or less. Yes. Now I posted it wider so you have some visitors, I think, from around the world and other places too. Hope that's okay. Oh, great. Of course, of course. More the merrier. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, um, Nico, is it okay if we start? Go ahead. Okay. All right. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to uh, to see everybody, and hopefully, everyone in good health and staying well, staying uh, occupied, and and. Uh, hopefully active and healthy while we're, while we're on this uh, shutdown. Um, let's hope that there'll be good news in a few weeks that we'll be able to, to again start getting out more and, and meeting up again. Um, today we actually have a speaker that uh, I recommended. Sometimes it's nice to bring in some speakers that are, are not necessarily directly in, in geology. And in fact, uh, so we brought Jay Silverstein who, who comes from the field of anthropology and archeology. span He is, um, has done a lot of work all over the world, which is one of the reasons I, I was very excited to, to invite him to talk about um, some of these, one, one of these, to choose one of his many interesting projects to, to talk to us about. And particularly because there, we have this overlap between different fields, and I think um, you'll certainly find in the things he's talking about issues and ideas and uh, approaches that that overlap with what what we're involved in. Um, Jay and I, uh, full disclosure, um, I actually have known Jay since the late 1990s. Uh, when I was a master's student at Penn State, he was in the midst of his PhD, and I think I even I don't think I babysat, but I think I actually tutored his youngest daughter um, while we were there. So, so I've known Jay, Jay for quite a while and his family. Um, he did his uh, doctorate at, at Penn State. He, prior to going to school, uh, going to, to graduate school and studying archaeology, uh, and I mention this because, you know, sometimes our career paths can be rather winding, and he actually came from as he was a police officer before he came back and decided to, to go and study uh, archaeology theology and anthropology. He then, he, following his uh, completion of his degree, he'd been working on projects in Mexico. He's going to be talking about the site of Tikal, and I won't uh, go into too much detail since he'll be talking about that, but he's also currently the co-director of the Tel Tamai project in, in the Nile Delta in Egypt. So he's effectively both a Mesoamerican archaeologist as well as an Egyptologist at this point. And one of the other things that he's done, if, if that's not enough, is he took on a position um, in the missing, missing in action uh, department searching for MIAs from, from foreign wars of the United States. And so he did that for, my goodness, uh, I think nearly 16, 17 years, um, while at the same time also doing adjunct teaching and continuing in archeology span um, doing that. So, this was a role that he had where he was able to apply these techniques and tools from archaeology in order to help find um, through that both doing archaeological research as well as uh, searching for for MIAs. So he has a very interesting and, and exciting background and I'm very happy to, to have him join us today. So go ahead, Jay. Okay, well, thank you. It's certainly an honor to be here, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Oh, I should mention where you are now. Okay, also oh, mention where yeah. you are now. Your, your current. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm currently uh, in Siberia. That's the, the background's artificial, I have to admit. So, so the background is actually Guatemala. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, about minus 30 degrees outside right now. Um, so, but we can travel virtually, thank goodness, to this, this modern age that we live in. 
Uh, otherwise, you know, like plagues in the past, we'd be stuck like Isaac Newton or Shakespeare, you know, writing great works, but we're able to spend our time on Facebook and wasting our time that way. Uh, but it allows us to interact as well. So today I was gonna to talk about the great earthwork of Tikal and the, the title is, When is a Wall Not a Wall? So first let me talk just a little bit about Tikal because sometimes people get confused. So Tikal should not be confused with Yavin 4 from Star Wars. They look similar, uh, but on the top you see Yavin 4, the bottom is Tikal or as the Maya would have called it, uh, I think it's uh, Yash Mutal. Uh, and also the Yavin 4 is located a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, whereas Tikal is located about 1500 years ago in the Paten Forest of Guatemala. So we'll be talking about to call um, and, and not, not the, the other. Putting it into its situation culturally, you can see that Tikal is sort of uh, a key site in the center of the Maya culture area. So the Maya civilization, which flourished in Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras, um, Tikal was, was one of the major classic um, city-states within the Maya um, uh, civilization area. And it, it was one of the most powerful uh, city-states. It had a lot of interactions with Mexico. Uh, and it was really one of the, the, the archetypal Maya sites. To go to the question that I'm asking, when is a wall not a wall? Well, it, it's not a wall when it's a uh, ex uh, trench excavated into a Cretaceous um, uh, calcium carbonate sedimentary layer, and it's not functioning at a defensive purpose. So I'm giving you the answer to, the, to the, this talk to start with. And the question is, where did this confusion come in? Why is the great earthwork of Tikal considered a great defensive earthwork, and then now that's being challenged by some of the data that we collected through a, a series of um, uh, surveys and excavations that we conducted uh, in the early part of this cur uh, the current century, so between 2001 and 2007. So one thing to understand is, is that the Maya civilization is, became representative, I think, of the, the epitome of what a mysterious civilization is in the field of archaeology. So when we first began to learn about the Maya in, in modern society in the, in the mid, uh, in the early part of the 19th century, uh, Frederick Catherwood had, had gone down and was visiting, was doing drawings, his lithographs were being published, and the world saw these massive pyramids and this architecture and these, this civilization lost and buried within the jungles of Guatemala. Uh, and, and so this, of course, opened it up to kind of flights of fancy of, of lost Atlantis, of lost tribes of Israel, um, of, of ancient aliens later on, uh, that, you know, who could explain how this, this great civilization could have been, could have fallen into to ruin and been swallowed by the, the uh, uh, the jungles and the forest. Uh, as we got out of World War I, the, the thoughts about the Maya began to turn to maybe there's a better way for civilization to exist and, and sort of a, as a reaction to the violence and the horror of World War I was this, this creation of an ideal civilization of astronomer kings. And the Maya were, were, were set up as as a, a, something that we could strive to be, is that we can be better than we were in World War I, that we could be a civilization that was peaceful and dedicated to science. Um, and here you can see uh, on a vase painting, a Maya scribe learning his trade. You can see the Maya numbering system represented here. So here you had a, a, a base 20 system using uh, zero, which uh, you know, was not known to other, many other civilizations at the time period. You can see that the Maya script, you know, that was clear, even though we couldn't read it, you know, at the end of World War I, but that it was clear that there was a sophisticated grammar and syntax to Maya writing that, that was not matched anywhere else in the Americas. By the time we get out of World War II, 
there's um, a, a growing realization that the Maya maybe were not so peaceful. More and more data is starting to show up. And here you can see one of the paintings from the murals of Bonham Park um, showing Maya warfare. Uh, by the time we get into the 60s during the Vietnam era with the influence of, of the backlash against war in America, um, there's a, a, a movement of viewing the Maya now as extremely warlike and that war was the cause of the collapse of their civilization uh, and that, that they were involved in all this fighting that was all these competing city-states fighting with each other uh, and that war pervaded everything and, it, and they entered into this escalation of, of militarism that eventually led to the collapse of the civilization. So enter into the scene in 1966, uh, a young archeologist named Dennis Pulliston was working on his PhD at the site of Tikal. And he's doing a series of transects in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west from the central Acropolis of Tikal, as you can see the central Acropolis behind me. Um, and uh, uh, in the north, about five kilometers out from the Acropolis, he ran into what appeared to be a defensive earthwork. So he, he mapped out uh, about eight kilometers of it, eight and a half kilometers of it in the north. And it was this linear formation. He did a series of test excavations, three excavations, to test the hypothesis that it, this was an earthwork. And he got this basic model of what he thought the earthwork looked like, where you have a, a foss or a, a trench or a moat that goes down about three meters. And then you have a rampart or embankment on the south side of the trench that stands about two meters. And so it, it fit the dimensions and expectations of what you might see from an extensive earthwork. Uh, here you can see these are his, uh, one of his excavations. And here you can see there's a bridge going across the trench. So here again is that embankment, the ditch, and here's what the, the bridge would have looked like as he imagined it. And so this began to build a model of what this earthwork meant to Tikal. And so here you can see the earthwork running along the north boundary. And then they found another segment of the earthwork running along the southeast over here. Now it was a logical conclusion that this was an, an outer perimeter to the city here in central Tikal where the Acropolis is, uh, and that this was used to establish the, the boundaries of the city-state. So the, these were the walls guarding the hinterlands and within these, between the Acropolis and these walls, this would have been all the, the main settlement of the city-state of Tikal. Uh, here you can see where Polston's excavations were to test it the dimensions, and then they imagined that there must be an earthwork that must have run all the way along the south as well, and that these earthworks were then anchored into these swamps or these bajos, these low lands, um, and that they provided natural defense. And so between the earthworks and the natural defenses that the, the entire uh, city was protected by these earthworks. And this became embedded in the literature uh, so here you can see uh, a couple of, um, of the contemporary uh, Mayanists writing that form a combined obstacle, um, you know, six meters high and almost certainly topped by further parapet. No evidence of that archaeologically, but it became embedded in the literature that there was. Uh, this elaborate and expensive barrier shows every sign of being an active fortification. So this fed into this whole militarized model of the Maya that this, this city was so involved in defending itself that it, it, it built this extensive kilometers and kilometers of wall to protect the, the uh, entire circumference of the city state. Now, the data is limited, and one of the reasons it's limited is that it's not easy to find sites in the forest in Guatemala. Here you can see what I look like after a day of cutting a trail, um, to, trying to create a shortcut to get out to the, the um, earthworks from uh, the Acropolis, uh, that finding archeological sites in this type of forest uh, on foot is not easy. Conducting line surveys is very difficult with, through that type of um, thick foliage. 
Uh, you can be right next to a pyramid and, and not even realize it sometimes, or a house settlement, um, just because you, you just have so little vi uh, vi uh, visual ability to, to perceive archaeological ruins. Another reason that we didn't learn any more about the earthworks since the 1960s, because really, after Pulliston's work there, no one had returned to the earthworks, uh, we can probably attribute to the god Chalk. Now, Chalk was an important deity to the Maya, the god of rain, god of storms, uh, and, and we'll come back to the concept of rain, but, but with regard to the research that was going on there, Chalk played a, a really important role. Here you can see the Pyramid of El Castillo at Chichen Itza. Now, Dennis Pulliston, uh, who had since gotten his PhD and was still working in the Maya region and had every intent, I believe, to go back to work on these earthworks, was one day in the 1970s up on top of the Pyramid of El Castillo uh, during a rainstorm, and he went up and he, and he put his hands up and he, and he challenged the god Chalk and said, Chalk, here I am, because Chalk was known for accepting human sacrifices. Um, and tragically, uh, Chalk responded with a bolt of lightning, killing Dennis Pulliston on top of the pyramid. Uh, and so his work ceased, his files were all boxed up and, and sent to uh, Princeton, uh, where they were put in the rare books room, never to be looked at again until um, uh, my professor and, and I assume Bev's professor uh, in about 2000 said, hey, you know what, we should go take a look at those earthworks again. And uh, so I went to Princeton, got all of Pulliston's notes out of the rare books room, began going through it, and we began devising a project to, to revisit those earthworks. And not to challenge Pulliston's conclusions, but to elaborate on them, because we could not imagine from what we had seen from Pulliston's diagrams and all the publications that the earthworks were anything but a defensive feature, that they were something meant to protect the city of Tikal. So again, looking at the, the, the model of Tikal and its hinterlands, and this is sort of where our starting point was, is this is what we knew existed. Uh, and this was, the challenge was originally just to find Pulliston's excavations um, out there in the, in the jungle. Uh, fortunately, he was a, a excellent mapper, and even though he was just using a compass and pacing for his mapping techniques, uh, his, his maps were extremely accurate. Um, going back and, and reopening some of his excavations, part of the deal was our permit with the, with the government of Guatemala was that we would find his excavations and backfill them because he had never backfilled them. Um, so we opened them up again. Uh, and his reconstruction seemed pretty accurate. So looking at the bridge, I, I did excavations there, reopened his excavation, and it, it seemed to pretty much confirm what he was talking about. Uh, again, looking at the scale, and, and uh, Bev will recognize uh, David Webster there as, a, as my scale for two meters, um, or almost two meters. <laughs> uh, and so you can see that the scale is, again, consistent with what was expected from a defensive feature. Now, Pulston had considered other hypotheses. He'd considered that perhaps these were some sort of canal system. But when you looked at the, the disposition of these earthworks on the topography, we saw that the earthworks were running up and down and up and down and up and down and that they were running, uh, as it turns out, up and down into the catchment basins. And so they'd run down one slope, bottom out at the catchment basin then come up the next slope and, and so on. Uh, down at the bottom, sometimes you had big gaps where the earthwork disappeared into these bajos, into these kind of swampy lowlands at the base of a catchment basin. Well, it was a linear structure, but he rightly assumed it couldn't be a canal because water is not going to flow up and down with the contours of, of the valleys. Uh, just a, a look at what the, the uh, earthwork looks like. We can see the trench and the cut and the limestone here. Jay, can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. Um, is the the cut that that Cut. I mean, those are all, those are quarried. I mean, those are actually quarried out into the limestone. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we as we move on here. But yeah, it's 
there's, there's no question that these are man-made teachers. Uh, so as we conducted our study of it, we saw that we found more earthworks than Polston had originally found, but, but not necessarily where were predicted by the model of it being a, a, a perimeter around the city. Uh, we also found that there were articulations in the earthwork where it would split off into different paths. Uh, again, not consistent with it being a fortification. And that we found that the gaps in the earthwork that Polston had run into, um, that where, where it went into these bajos, uh, these, these, these lowlands, um, he assumed that the, the, the uh, erosion in the in these bajos had, had covered up the earthwork that it must have run through these bajos uh, but then that was just lost over time due to the, the movement of the soils when the soils became saturated um, and that and he did an excavation in one of the bajos during the dry season to to see if he could find it and he thought he found it but then the rain started and his entire trench collapsed in on him uh, so uh, he, he made this assumption that there was a prolongation of the earthworks through these lowlands, um, but, but our excavations ended up showing that that was a, a false assumption. Uh, and then we also found that there were places where the, the placement of the earthworks was simply inconsistent with any sort of defensive doctrine. You know, when you're building a fortification, you're always looking for, for high ground and the most defensible areas. And you're going to put your fortifications to take advantage of the natural uh, topography. And here the earthworks were acting completely counterintuitive in, in many places to that. And we also found that the morphology of the earthworks was not always consistent with what that, that ideal situation where you had a foss of, of two or three meters deep and an embankment of two meters tall that there were places where it did not match the scale and design that Pulliston had assumed would, could be um, representative of the entire earthwork. So if you look at where we found other elements of the earthwork, you can see the red lines here. Uh, here up in the north uh, west, you can see one of the bifurcations where one branch is, is spinning off up here to the northwest. And then you can see going, you, you have another big bajo here, and then you have pieces of the earthwork picking up over here. And then you found other segments over here. Here's what Pulston had originally found. We found more running along here. Uh, and then we also found some in here. So looking at this one bifurcation as an example, so the, uh, the blobs here are, are settlements in the scale of the, the um, size of the settlement is represented by the size of the, the little pyramid. But here at the bifurcation, you can see that this one branch ran right up here and it ran into what, uh, what's called an aguada, which is basically a water storage pool. Um, and these can occur naturally or they can be um, man-made. Oftentimes they're, they were man-made where they'd excavate into these bajos and then they would line them uh, and use these as, as water storage to, to keep water going through the, the dry season. And I'll talk a little bit about the meteorology as well, um, the, the seasonality of rains here. So, so this became a, you know, a bit of a mystery when we found this branch that terminated quite specifically into an aguada. So here you can see David Webster standing in the middle of the aguada. It doesn't look like much here, but we could tell from plastic bottles that, that people who were looting in the forest now were still using this aguada during the wet season to get water at it. Uh, so during the wet season, it would still fill up. But this would have been, if you excavated down, you'd find probably a lining of a, of a bowl-shaped um, structure that was used for holding water. And, and the earthwork was terminating at one of these, which was very consistent with a hydraulic function as opposed to a defensive function. So here you have that, that bifurcation. And then also over here, there was a junction where it seemed that there were uh, five different lines of earthwork coming together uh, in, into one spot. Gave kind of a, um, a, a natural sort of water run or arroyo, uh, continuation of the human excavation, and then some, some branches also. So it seemed that 
something else was going on here rather than a defensive function for these, these trenches that were excavated or naturally eroded within the limestone. I mentioned in the Bajo uh, where Polston had excavated, thinking that he saw what, what was an extension of the earthwork, a prolongation of the earthwork, we could actually, once you got down through these very clay, very hard soils uh, during the dry season, um, we could see what was actually more the shape of a bottom of a pool rather than a continuation of the earthwork. And so it seemed that, that rather than a prolongation, that when these earthworks were coming down and, and hitting these low spots, that they were hitting the low spot at a, at a pooling point, uh, at an intentional and constructed and excavated aguada rather than a prolongation of a, some sort of defensive wall that was going into these, into these swamps. When we look at different profiles of the earthworks at different places along the wall, we can see that there was quite a bit of variation in it. So there were places where it could be quite small, um, places where it had a little bit different morphology, places where it had a, like a little uh, trough at the bottom that you could easily just step across. You can see this is um, you know, half a meter, um, places where it was almost stepped going up. And then you had places where it seemed that the, um, that there had been erosion that had brought, uh, um, taken out, uh, undermined parts of the walls. Um, geologically, the, the top uh, half meter of the limestone karst tends to be very hard and is good rock for construction. Underneath it, it is very soft. And so um, the, the hard term and, and the Aztec term would be caliche. It's a leached out limestone that becomes um, something that you could carve into construction blocks. And then underneath is very much like chalk, uh, saskab. It's a, a, a very soft, eroded, old limestone that's very good for making lime plaster, things like that. Um, it, but it's also much more subject to erosion. And so you can see that you have undermining going on here, suggesting that there's some sort of erosion events going on uh, that are that would um, pull away the the uh, saskab. So if you look at the range of variation in the morphology of the earthwork, you can see here's the the one that that Poulston imagined for the entire earthwork. Um, here's one variation of it, uh, and here's another variation of it that you could just easily hop across. Uh, and so there was a lot of differences in how this earthwork was constructed. Now you can imagine scenarios where maybe it was not complete over here that they just started, uh, but uh, oftentimes it, these were on the upper slopes, the smaller ones, uh, and close to the, the settlements as opposed to the, the deeper ones which were lower down on the slopes. And then the other thing was just the situation of the earthwork. So the red line here shows the earthwork going up and down the valleys, going up and down the hills and valleys, coming down into these, these bajos. There's that bifurcation ending in the aguado over here. Uh, and then just doing some GIS modeling, if I were looking for creating a line of fortifications, taking advantage of the highlands, it would have been very easy to have designed a fortification that followed the natural contours that gave you a, def a, a, a significant defensive advantage in various different ways, rather than choosing this line that was going up and down into these lowlands, uh, which just sort of defines any sort of military doctrine. Uh, there were places, here you can see a contour map with the earthwork, so here you have the ditch and the embankment. Um, this is going to Tikal, to the Acropolis, and this is to the north. But what you can see is that you have a very steep slope on the opposite side of the earthwork. So the people on the slope would actually have an elevation advantage against anyone who was on the embankment. So again, why would you place an earthwork like that when you would lose any sort of defensive advantage? Uh, here you can see uh, the earthwork and uh, a major settlement but you can also see that the settlement is just north of the earthwork. So it's outside the city wall rather than inside the city wall. Uh, again, defying uh, 
you know, your, your basic concepts of what this wall would have been for. And again, you can imagine a scenario where the wall was built and then the settlement was expanding beyond that. And so, so it's not completely unreasonable, but uh, it does it does give uh, one more factor that suggests that maybe there's a function other than defense for the existence of this earthwork. So what's our alternative hypothesis then? If it's not primarily a defensive earthwork, it has to do with the, the nature of the geology of the region and the, the weather pattern. So we're talking about this karst landscape, which is extremely porous. And we're talking about a landscape that is very limited access to surface water, particularly during the dry season. Uh, so these, these bajos even will dry, dry up. So they're very dependent on the seasonal rain. So between uh, May and November, when you get, you know, 80 percent or more of the water will fall during that time period. And then you have the dry season after that where there just is no water. Because this karst is so porous that the, there's a, a rapid rate of infiltration. So this water does not exist on the surface very long. You don't get a lot of erosion troughs or, or anything like that. It, it absorbs into the, the karst very quickly. Now, one of the, the our foremost sources on the Maya is uh, Bishop Diego de Landa, famous for burning many of the Maya books and destroying their monuments. And then uh, after being condemned by the church for the damage he'd done to the Maya culture, um, writing a book and trying to capture some of the Maya culture. Uh, one of the things that he wrote is this, this quote, according to the wise, one of the things most needed by man is water, without which the earth cannot produce its fruits or man live. In this respect, nature has acted differently in this country from the rest of the world, where the rivers and springs flow above ground, whereas here all run in secret channels underground. Now he was in the, the Yucatan and, and the karst is a little bit newer there, quite a bit newer there. And so you have different types of, of uh, water table and formation where you have a lot more underground channels and, and these things called cenotes, these collapsed uh, limestone caverns that fill with water. Uh, whereas the older karst that you have in the Paten region where Tikal is, uh, doesn't sustain these, these big underground um, caverns, but it does still follow this idea that the water is infiltrating into the limestone and, and that you have a saturation of the limestone um, and, and that your water is not on the surface very often. So if you look at the rainfall pattern, you can see that it very much will, will begin uh, in April or, or May, uh, that you get your main rain, uh, and then it will almost disappear completely uh, once you get to November. Also, you can see in this example from uh, 2010 that you have this dip in the middle of your rainy season. So this is the, the canicular drought. Um, that, that can happen on occasion, can last a week or two weeks in the middle of the rainy season. Now, the main crop for the Mayo was, was maize or, or corn, uh, and they would plant at the beginning of the rainy season, um, and they would depend on the rainy season to be somewhat consistent. If that canicular drought happened and it, and it lasted more than five days, it could actually be very devastating to their main crop. And uh, there's one ethnographic example of a canicular grout, uh, drought in the 1950s where 90% uh, of the farmers in this one region where this, um, where one of my old professors had been doing his dissertation work, uh, lost 80% of their crops. So canicular drought could be completely devastating to your crop. And so the Maya had to adapt to this, this rainfall regimen. And they had to find different strategies using multiple cropping um, strategies and also making use of the environmental variation within their, their homeland. And that's, we tend to look at the, the forest of a place like Tikal and, and think of it uh, as homogenous, you know, that you have Bajo and you have forest and that you only have those two things. But what you realize is that every catchment basin has a series of micro environments within it and that they had learned to exploit 
those variations such as the upslope versus the mid slope versus the toe slope versus the bajo. And they all had different advantages that could allow them to mitigate some of the risks associated with farming in this type of um, you know, rainfall regime in the seasonal environment with the potential for this, this canicular drought. So you see the effect of this even in modern times when, you, when you're in the dry season in, uh, in Tikal, this is just outside Tikal, that everybody, all the farmers uh, and the villagers put every sort of water container they have out alongside the road and a government truck will come by and fill those up with water. So the people are still dependent on trying to get their water somehow during the, the dry season and, and the government has filled in the gap that people would have had to fill it, figure out how to fill in uh, in ancient times on their own. So what are your options for getting water? You, one is to tap an aquifer and you can do that with a vertical shaft um, or a horizontal shaft, something like a, a conat. Uh, or you can use redistribution like we just saw with the, the drums that people put out where you expect importation or you can build a canal to carry the water to you. Or you can use a form of collection where you're catching precipitation. So you can either capture it as runoff or you can capture it after it infiltrates into the ground. So you can tap into the ground and get the water that's moving in within that limestone. So we know that at Tikal, so in the Acropolis, uh, that they had mastered the art of collecting water as runoff. And so every plaza was sloped and, and had channels underneath it that would collect water and deposit that water into um, man-made aguadas or person-made aguadas. Uh, and so you see, even see that the pyramids that were built here parallel the presence of aguadas. So they would, they would carve into the bedrock for their construction stone and for their lime for plaster build a pyramid and then make an aguada. And so that the pyramids and the aguadas, you know, paralleled each other. And so that they had mastered the, this ability to optimize the rainfall and, and maintain year round occupation by collecting and storing water throughout the entire year. So the, the Acropolis had, had done a fantastic job of this and, and every small plaza group out anywhere in this region is still using the same techniques where, where plazas are sloped, um, buildings are set to, to be able to collect the water and store the water into artificial collection points, um, either aguadas or also a, um, a small chamber that they would carve into the limestone called a choltum. Uh, and, and water could be stored in there and then sometimes those would even be capped. They could lift up the cap to, to have access to, to the water. Uh, here's just an example of one of the, the channels inside the uh, Acropolis that's meant to collect and move the water around into those, those major aguadas. Again, just another view of the shape and topography of, of the Acropolis and the, and the location of the aguadas. So, I mean, this is, explains how you have this major civilization with all these accomplishments flourishing in this type of environment that has some severe limitations. And if you didn't adapt to them and didn't come up with these adaptations for collecting that water, there's just no way you'd be able to maintain a major civilization. So what I'm proposing for this earthwork is that it's not primarily a defensive earthwork, although there may have been secondary functions for it there. Um, but that it was designed to collect the water that infiltrates through the limestone. Um, it collects it and then it would run it down the slope and deposit that water into these aguadas that were carved in the bottom, uh, in, these, in these bajos, in, uh, the bottom of the catchment basins. Uh, and so what you have is that you've got a couple of different actions that would help collect the water in here. One is the, when the rain falls and it soaks into the limestone, which happens very quickly, um, it, it'll still follow the slope and flow down. Uh, if you cut a slot into the surface, 
that water is going to start to fill up and flow down here. And then also you'll have capillary action hitting the phreatic zone, right? The, the water saturation point within the, the limestone. And the capillary action is also going to be pulling water up that would also fill in this, this trench. I think the, the easiest way to imagine it is if you imagine if you have a sponge that's completely saturated and then you, you put it at an angle and carved a, a trough through it, that that trough is going to fill up with that water and that water is going to run off where that trough ends off the sponge. And that's what they were doing to the landscape is, is treating it like that. So you have, again, the, the, the infiltration of the water and then you have the phreatic zone or saturation zone uh, that would be bringing water up and also filling in the ditch. And then the, the water would be moving uh, down slope into these aguadas. So what was originally deemed as an attribute of uh, denying that the earthworks could be a hydraulic construction actually was, was instrumental to the functioning of the earthworks as a hydraulic uh, construction. So these slopes, as the, as the earthwork move up and down these catchments, these were essential to being able to direct that rainfall water, that infiltrating water, to the points of collection so that they could have those stored up and use them. Um, and, and so, yeah, so rather than, as, as Pulliston had said, that this, it couldn't be a hydraulic construction, it couldn't be a canal, he was right about that, but it could be something else that would collect water. So again, looking at the, at the uh, earthwork along the north frontier. And here you can see uh, we've uh, used GIS to divide up the topography into different catchment basins. And what you can see is that the earthwork traverses these catchment basins and has a downslope on both sides uh, and going into these the bajos in each catchment. And then you also see that the settlement pattern, that you have your larger settlements oftentimes at the junction of these catchments. So that your, your political, economic, and administrative centers would have greater control over more catchment variations. So they'd have more of these uh, control of these different microenvironments that each offer different economic advantages uh, for, you know, most uh, predominantly for growing corn. Uh, also from ethnographic work, we, we see that some of the cultural adaptations that the, the modern Maya had done, again, this is the, the middle of the um, uh, 20th century, that they had developed uh, three different planting schemes they had. So you had your normal, your main planting season, which was right when those rains would start. You want to get the corn you'd, and you plant on the mid slope, take advantage of that rain. Um, you'd have an early planting that you could do down in the Bajo, if there's enough water left in the Bajo that you had moisture that you could do an early planting. Uh, and then if you had to, you could do a November planting, a late planting. Um, you know, if, 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 there was a, if there was enough saturation in water. What the, what the accumulation of water in the Bajo would have done would have given you the means to, to mitigate some of the, those risks that were involved. You could, it could support your early plantings. It could, it could allow you to pot irrigate your later plantings. If you hit a hard canicular drought that was lasting more than five days, you could pot irrigate your, your normal planting during that time period by going to the, you know, taking the water from your storage facility, your, your, your aguada, and using it to water your plants from your, your, your normal planting season that are on your mid slope. So it allowed this, this variation of the slopes uh, and, the, and the water to, to be taken advantage of and to, again, mitigate the risks that would be associated with a variable environment. Uh, the, the planting seems to be supported by the um, carbon-14 uh, um, isotope analysis of soil samples from the region where we can see that they're taking advantage of these toe slopes right down into the aguadas. Uh, and so just looking at the levels of enrichment that, that give us suggestions that the soils there were used for maize agriculture. Uh, oftentimes that these, these toe slopes and these bajos were assumed to be not plantable and not usable for agriculture, but we're seeing that in fact they were. 
Again, just looking at the settlement pattern and the, and the catchment arrangement. So here you can see the settlements being put often at the top of the hills, which is good defensively and politically, uh, while your earthwork is, is much more variable and oftentimes following these, these up and downs with these, these slopes. Just another view with the catchments outlined here. And again, the settlement hierarchy. So we still have a lot of questions, like why is it in a line, right? If they're just taking advantage of the catchments and collecting water, there's no reason to, to make an alineation of these earthworks along this entire northern boundary, um, which, is, which is clearly done here. And, and part of that could be a lack of data. There could be earthworks all through here that we just haven't ever found. Um, and so it could be an accident, but I, I think more likely that the, the Maya had some other intent as well, not just for water collection. Maybe it was a boundary marker marking the north boundary of the, of the, of the polity sometime in the fifth century. Uh, maybe it was for religious purposes. The, the embankment that was built from the excavation of the, the trench would have been very bright white. Uh, and in Maya, the term Sak Bay is a, a white road, often has religious as well as you know, practical um, meaning. So you would have had a very bright white road running along the entire north of the, of the um, polity uh, and in other parts of it as well. So there could have been religious purposes, maybe processionals associated with the Aguadas and other places where water is stored, because water was obviously of extreme religious importance. Uh, and there's a lot of ceremonies throughout the Maya region associated with the seasonality, um, you know, praying for rain, worshiping to, to Chalk, the, the rain god. Um, there could have been defensive purposes in some places. It would have, as you see from Poulsen's original um, sketch. One thing that's that is different about the Maya compared to other civilizations is their ability to multi-purpose construction. Is when we're looking at those temples in the in the central Acropolis, where you have your construction quarry becomes your water storage facility, and the and the, and the excavated blocks of limestone become your temple. Um, so here, excavating these trenches allowed them to build the road. It also allowed them to cut through that top half meter of hard limestone and use that for construction purposes. And we did find blocks of it nearby that were being carved into, into various things, such as a, a stella that would be used then for, to record uh, historical events and religious events, um, that they would dig down and they would get that lime, that soft saskab, which they would use to make plaster. Uh, you would also find nodules of flint within that limestone. And, and of course the flint was very power, uh, important for making tools. And so, so these things are, serve multiple purposes. And, and unlike say the Romans who said, let's build an aqueduct and they would build an aqueduct and that aqueduct would last forever and it would be only an aqueduct. Here, if the Maya were building a plaza or a temple or an earthwork, it's okay, it's an earthwork and it's for collecting water and it's a road and it's, you know, it's, and it's a quarry and it's, you know, uh, multiple, multiple purposes that the Maya seem to be very good about um, really applying their energy to when they constructed something to make it useful in, in many different ways. So looking at our, our model here and North is, is kind of running off this way. Uh, you can see this is the, the uh, rectangle is the national park boundary. Here's the Acropolis. And then here you can see the various pieces of earthwork that we have found. And then the, the blue is the, the, the large bajos. And some of the bajos will retain water all year round, and, you know, and you will find things like um, uh, alligators, things like that in, in them. Uh, some of the most current research, of course, being done is LIDAR. And uh, this is going to change our ability to collect data. I showed you that picture of what it was like to collect data out there in the past. Now, using the, the most recent incarnations of LIDAR, it's much more affordable. 
the platforms are much smaller. Even now you can do it off of a drone and the software and the hardware are able to penetrate for uh, forest canopy now. We had tried using um, synthetic aperture radar uh, back in the early, in, in the 2000s with NASA, um, but we just were not able to get the resolution to be able to penetrate the forest canopy. Now using the LIDAR, which will send so many, you know, um, uh, beams down that you can mathematically sort out the ones that are penetrating through the canopy and you can reconstruct the surface. And so you can actually see um, all the architecture and the, and the trenches and the causeways. Uh, and they haven't got to this northern area of the earthwork yet, but the, the, there's a project in process now that should be able to reveal, you know, the full extent of the earthworks of Tikal, and it should help us understand a lot better. Uh, there, there is still the problem of having to ground truth though, and I've talked to some of the people who've been working on the new project with the LIDAR, and they see a line like that, and they instantly assume again that it's a fortification. And my, my point is that, no, you need to go out and ground truth it, and you need to put it into a larger context before you can make the assumption that that, that wall is a wall as opposed to, to something else. Uh, so, the conclusions on this, that the earthworks were not constructed primarily as a defensive feature, that a hydraulic hypothesis um, would allow them to augment their water storage in the aguadas at the edges of the Bajos, uh, that the growth of Tikal as it grew into a major power within the Maya civilization uh, required intensification of agriculture, that the ethnographic data on the planting strategies used in that region um, support the creations of the slope environment within these catchment basins. Uh, the soil data uh, suggests that this, this uh, is, is, um, supports this hypothesis of, of the exploitation of particularly going down into these low areas where these iguadas would have been down into these bajos. Um, that they were reclaiming that land and using it and thus needed to maintain the water within that land. Uh, and that this, the earthworks were part of this Bajo exploitation strategy by, by making sure that you had a store of water uh, that you could use throughout the year within those areas. And also then that these catchment basins represent political and economic um, aspects of the organization of Maya civilization within this particular landscape. So as Abraham Lincoln once said, northern human occupation opens so wide a field for the profitable and agreeable combination of labor with cultivated thought as agriculture. And I think that holds very true in these circumstances of how the Maya adapted to what would otherwise be a marginal landscape that people would not expect a major civilization to, to emerge in. It doesn't fit our, our you know, Whip Fogel's model of, of, a, uh, you know, of a river based civilization. So with that, just a lot of thanks to um, David Webster and Horacio Martinez, Tim Murtha and Kirk Strait from uh, uh, Penn State, uh, as well as the Soils people from Brigham Young University and the various institutes and institutions that have supported this work. Uh, and I think we can open the floor to questions. Okay. Okay, Nico has put me in charge of questions. So I'm going to start with first, if you want to open up your mics and just give a little applause. We're not together, but you know, to give a sense that we are together. So thank you. <laughs> so they can feel that there are humans in the room. <laughs> okay. Um, there were quite a few taps in the symbols here. Uh, uh, yes, I see them. I, you know, having multiple screens is, is such a, um, it's so important now you know, that you have at least two screens, I think. <laughs> yeah. People and your slides at the same time. Absolutely. And I apologize, there will be some students leaving because I think there's a, a class that's directly, um, that starts very soon, but some will stay, some will go. Um, so I'm going to take questions as soon as I can, especially since some students are leaving. Um, question about, um, okay, so someone, someone asked whether defensive structures would usually have a road 
a road net as well? Like, would it be, would, do you, do you, when you do see definitive defense structures, do you see them associated with roads? I think is that. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly when we have extensive um, uh, defensive structures on, on frontiers like the Great Wall of China or Hadrian's Wall, that they're incorporated into a road network, right? The, the, the Great Wall of China, you know, you could run two chariots a, across and, and Hadrian's Wall again was, you know, that the soldiers could move all along the wall. Uh, we don't have many examples in the new world of, of extensive, you know, hinterland frontier like this. And so this was quite exceptional. Now we do have fortifications in the Maya region and this shouldn't be interpreted to say that the Maya were peaceful or or anything else or that they didn't, that defense wasn't a major concern for them at various times in, in their history and that warfare was, was prevalent. Um, but the, the roads that we do have with the Maya are generally not associated with defensive structures. The defensive structures tend to be site specific, um, sometimes taking advantage of the topography, um, sometimes completely surrounding the Acropolis, sometimes hastily built when, when war was intensifying, such as a site like Los Pilos, where you have evidence of them tearing down buildings and building walls out of them when they're being besieged. Um, so, so we do see defensive structures like that in various ways, but, and as I said, uh, you know, cross-culturally, you, you do need transportation networks associated with extensive frontier um, uh, fortifications. So, so yes, but we don't have another example from, from the Americas that I can think of. Have, uh, I guess another thing people should think of when you're thinking about Europe versus the New World, you have to also remember, you know, very different transportation, very different, uh, <laughs> you know, people are on foot, they don't have huge beasts of burden, it's a, you know, different kind of uh, assemblage. Um, question came in about, uh, have they used geophysical methods like G GPR to follow along these earthworks? You know, how I, I see in the field you're doing through survey and of course not through LIDAR, but has it also been, do you know if it's been analyzed with uh, GPR? We, we did augering to do the soil sampling uh, and that was with the Brigham, Hung, uh, Brigham Young University Soils Department. Uh, out in the hinterlands. GPR has been used in the central Acropolis looking at the plazas and looking at some of the underground structures for, for, for channeling water there. But, um, you know, G GPR and other geophysical techniques are very difficult to use in that type of forest environment. You know, you, you kind of need open areas to be able to run geophysical survey. The, the LIDAR, of course, is, is our, you know, is, is, the, the new technology that is super applicable and, and will really, it has already changed our understanding of the extent of, of the modifications of the topography that the Maya have done th throughout the Maya region. Um, but no, out, out on the, the earthworks, um, I, I don't know how much, I mean, certainly we could, we could you know, clear out a section and try to run some sort of geophysical survey to help us understand the, the variations in morphology of the cut within the limestone. Um, but, uh, you know, through our, our test trenches, we were able to get a pretty good snapshot of that already. Um, we get a range of the variation of the, the, the shape of those trenches. Uh, and we know pretty much what the geology is. And we're, and we're not looking, it's not like we have layers of buried structures there. The, the, Topsoil at Tikal tends to be fairly shallow, so usually 30 to 50 centimeters of, of you know, of organic soils that have formed since the Maya lived there. Um, so, and, that's, and that then lies right on top of that that limestone, that hard limestone. Um, and when you when you look at the settlements themselves, they would have all been stripped down to that hard limestone. They would have plastered uh, floors within the, the settlement areas. Um, so certainly there would be things that you could discover with, with some sort of geophysical survey, but it's just not practical in this sort of forest environment. I've, I, have a, I have a quick question. Uh, well, maybe not a quick question, but since, since this is presumably with what you talked about, the possible drought, you know, different um, summer droughts, you know, some years being worse, some years being better, and that perhaps this was some kind of, um, you know, <laughs> environmental defense mechanism for, for being able to make sure that they, they could control and, and have enough water for their crops. Um, 
do you have the dating on this? Does the dating happen to coincide with any known droughts, drought periods? Like what was the motivation? Was it related more to just the size of the population, do you think? Or could it have linked in with also some environmental shifts? Yeah, it very well could have. We don't have enough control of the dating of the earthwork itself. Um, but certainly there's been some excellent environmental reconstruction using lake coring and um, very sampling throughout the, the Maya region that, that we have these periods of prolonged drought that are, are very much, I think, associated with the collapse of the Maya civilization. You know, they could only mitigate to a certain point. Their population had grown very large. Um, so if they hit these extensive drought periods, you know, that, that it would have put extreme stress on the society. Um, but at this point, you know, we have a few ceramics that, that give us some possible, you know, dates within a range of the classic period for the construction of the earthwork. Some putting it, you know, into the middle of the fifth century AD, you know, to maybe the sixth century uh, or seventh century. Um, and in your major droughts, the, the, the ones that seem to be terminal to it are, you know, are, are later in the, you know, the um, eighth century. Uh, AD. So I, I think from the limited data that we have as far as chronological control is that this was more an aspect of the development and growth of the of the city state rather than a reaction to the stress of collapse of the city state. Okay. So not so a definitive answer. <laughs> So I'm very, um, I do have one last question. I know some people may need to leave, but I'll do this one last question before we officially end. Is that okay, Nico? We have time for one more? Yeah? Okay. Um, so <laughs> this could be a rather long question. So maybe uh, okay. <laughs> have a few thoughts on it because this could go quite a way because it's kind of the, the heart of the, the beast here. Um, I guess the, the question is, since structures can have multiple purposes and functions, um, how can the importance of each function of the structure be determined? That's a tough one. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a, a big picture question, but you know, how, I, I guess uh, what I was thinking about with this structure is with the defensive versus other use, I think it's interesting that you don't have a lot of construction on top of it, which makes me kind of think, uh, that its purpose, that that its primary purpose, maybe as a waterworks, was more functional than anything else. But but what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I, the fact that they they, I mean, to to function as this limestone filtration system, it had to follow certain rules as far as how it was placed on the, the topography. It had to cut at an angle down the slopes and end in the in the bajos. Um, so, so that seems to have been the driving force on it. Now that the, the fact that they decided to put it all, you know, connect all these different catchments in a line, that almost seems like it would have been the secondary thought to me. And, th and that if it occasionally would serve a defensive purpose um, to, to block a main road, for instance, maybe where the, the bridges where we found two bridges across it, um, that, that those were, you know, integrated into their their planning, but that the 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 shape of it and its willingness to to meet those requirements for water collection suggests to me that the primary function was was the water collection. Of course, you know, water collection and and survival of your crops was your you know without that you had nothing else anyways. So um, that seems to me to be the primary function that anything else would have been, hey, we can also do this, and hey, how about that? And, you know, and that people were figuring out what else, how else they could make use of this, this effort that they were putting into constructing it. And maybe after building one, you know, they saw, hey, we can do this now, and we, you know, and we can expand on that. Um, so I, I, I suspect because of the variation in morphology um, that, that construction was in part locally directed, by the, the local lord who would have been subject to the, the main lord at, at the call, but also that there would have been some direction coming from, from the king and the queen, you know, the, the, the main uh, lord of the city-state and saying, yeah, let's, let's build a, a, a line along the north here. 
um, so to make all these things line up together and connect. Excellent. Okay, well, I want to thank you again. And, and for those of you, we didn't make it totally clear. Uh, uh, Dr. Silverstein's uh, latest phase of his career has brought him to Siberia. So <laughs> those of you who are yeah. actually talking to us from uh, two men uh, in, in Siberia, we actually have a student, Svetlana, who's from Siberia. So, oh, uh, good, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> last, uh, week, uh, <laughs> last, oh, last week, we had the UAE and this week, Siberia. So uh, we're, we're making our rounds. And, and if I may say, next week, we're going to New York City. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure the weather is any better there at this point, but <laughs> All right, probably not. Just go there, I think. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, well again, thank you. you. I'll, I'll stay on for a few minutes, and you know, I might steal you over to a breakout room to, to have a chat. And yeah. uh, Emily, please invite him for a new one. Otherwise, uh, I need to. No problem. No problem. Jay, I'll send you a new invite. Take care, everybody. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Jay. Bye-bye.